Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my honor to present three scholars who, from different parts of the world, have done very valuable research into the identity and of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten and the ancient history of Egypt. Um, I would like to uh, present Dr. William Theo, who is a historian, um, a psychiatrist, who is president of Cybeck of New York, an educational research company where uh, his work in plural analysis is a new paradigm. He has also written The Art of Memory and Eknatan Moses Oedipus. Uh, Mr. Hamed Osman is here from England, and uh, he is a noted Egyptologist. Uh, his work uh, includes Out of Egypt uh, and other books, such as The House of the Messiah and um, Stranger in the Valley of the Kings and Moses, Pharaoh of Egypt, just to mention a few. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Charles Pope, who is a biblical researcher and is here from uh, Florida, joining us today. Um, his uh, work is published on the World Wide Web and is called Judeo Roots. And uh, Mr. Pope describes the research that the three have been uh, involved with, uh, first independently and, and now together, uh, for the first time, actually, in, in, uh, in this presentation. Uh, Mr. Pope called this research um, earth-shaking biblical archaeology. So without further ado, join me in welcoming the speakers. Thank you, Leona, and welcome to all of us. Um, I shall speak during half an hour. Then Mr. Hamed Osman will speak, and then Mr. Charles Pope. After which, questions may be asked, and eventually, a conversation will follow. So, I have been presented. William Theo, psychoanalyst living currently in Manhattan. It was never easy to express my thoughts in my natural language. So in English, sometimes it's close to a kind of amusing catastrophe. Fortunately, usually, it allows a certain quantity of information to be transmitted, and hopefully just what is necessary. However, I shall take the help of a few notes in order to make very clear my statement and a memory which resides inside of you, though in an unconscious state. I will present the work of a famous historian, Francis Yates, who worked in Italy and in England at the Royal University of London during the 20th century. Yates has described an event which lasts 16th century from the beginning of Christianity, in other words, with an early Christianism. Jesus Christ, early Christianism, and a pre-Renaissance phase and a renaissance phase. This event may be named Hermes tot Trismegistus. Hermes is an ancient Greek name which represents a traveler messenger. Thot is an ancient Egyptian name representing a lawgiver, especially giving the law of writings. The compound Hermes Thoth Trismegistus was introduced in Christianity by the fathers of the church, who designated him 
as the founder of the monotheism in humankind. They depicted him as a pharaoh, an Egyptian king. So we have here the chronological state, st scale, sorry, and we can here draw a map, which is the East Mediterranean area. We see here this pharaoh, Hermes Trismegistus. After this early age of Christianity, later in Europe, during the Middle Ages, the monotheist pharaoh Trismegistus was the patron of the alchemists. He had left the emerald tables on which were inscribed the law of nature. His teaching were delivered through text, articles, and book called the Hermetica. They were so spiritual and religious that under his influence, Europe was at that time counting four monotheisms. Chronologically, beginning with the most ancient, Hermetism, the religion of Hermes Trismegistus, then Judaism, Christianity, Islam. On the base of these four monotheisms, the Renaissance, or at least the conclusion of the Renaissance, imposed a severe censorship and repression of both the tradition and the memory of Hermes Trismegistus. In 1600, the Inquisition, with a limited set of arguments, alleged that Hermes Trismegistus was not historical, even less than a legend or a phantasm, but that he had been a forgery. Therefore, it didn't deserve any interest or attention. This is giving to our century an opportunity, our century, an opportunity for a learning about a mechanism of amnesia. It shows that after a trauma follow an oblivion, plus a taboo, which prevents the simple recovery of the repressed memory. Our century witnesses that and how dim, how dim a memory we have of these four monotheists. Maybe most of us uh, think that there has always been three monotheists. The 20th century witnesses also the discredit of alchemy with a taboo which prevented our education to teach us about this information. So how can we presently talk about it? This is because the amnesia is currently in process to be removed. Archaeology in the mid-century has found documents in the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt which definitely contradict the accusation of forgery. Actually, there is no argument for any invalidation of Hermes Trismegistus' memory, whose teachings stand equally beside the Bible the Upanishad, Confucius, the Tao, and other illustrious references. With this forceful rehabilitation, the taboo gradually yield to the recovery of memory, and historians can firstly retrieve and depict who was Hermes Trismegistus. He was called, called 
triplex, thrice, or trismegistus, which means triple master. For one, in Egypt, he had founded a solar city. And two, he was the initiator of Moses. Three, the initiator of Orpheus in Greece. After having described the essence of who was Trismegistus, historian can also retrieve why he has been repressed by the Renaissance. From 1500 until 1600, with new and well-substantiated evidence, the pharaoh Trismegistus began to be identified as Moses himself. During one century, scholars and religious people thought that they were one and the same person instead of master and disciple. The work, this, this theory began to be um, began with the work of Marcellus Ficinus in Italy, who was working for Cosme de Medicis in, uh, in, uh, in 1460. So during the 16th century, several popes regressed into ancient Egypt worship intending to retrieve the purity of the original source. Concurrently, Christianity was seen as a blend of Kabbalah and Orphic hymns, which was interpreted as a bad magic. With this cleavage, and this separation, the case of Moses' monotheist pharaoh had built a logic of duality, which was endangering Christianity, and the Vatican had little choice. Rather than seeing Christianity discarded, the Inquisition terminated Hermes Trismegistus instead. And it suppressed its memory. Christianity would continue with an absence and a taboo. In, its, in this mechanism, this process has revealed the weakness of the Hellenic link in comparison with the solid equation of Moses Pharaoh. Subsequently, in the post-Renaissance, a series of occult and esoteric schools attempted to decipher, to decipher the Hellenic face of Hermes Trismegistus. Noticeably, these investigations sought su support in the figure of Oedipus. Just after the Renaissance, Kircher in France, in Avignon, a Jesuit linguist, titled his study Oedipus Egyptianus. Later, during the revolution in Paris, while creating the Felibridge Poetic School in Avignon, too, the Egypto-Hebraic linguist Fabre d'Olivet linked the poetic Orphic alphabet with hieroglyphs. Further, we arrive to the 20th century, where when the initiated poet Jean Cocteau who has lately been revealed as a noticeable initiate, 
describe the consequences of ignoring Oedipus behind Orpheus. Maybe just a note here about Oedipus, who for some of us may have a kind of bad reputation of immorality. But looking back to the text, to the origin of the legend, Oedipus is someone who has failed or fault or sin without knowing what he was doing. And when he learned that he, was, he had killed his father and was incestuous, he was ashamed and punished himself. Therefore, the prejudice of immorality may be suspected for being uh, an operation or a trick of the taboo. To finish with the 20th century, today in USA, the scientific Martin Bernal, Cornell University, in his study titled Black Athena, describe how Oedipus must be recognized as an African. But, of course, also, during this 20th century, we find a major study about Oedipus, which has been undergone by Sigmund Freud. Remarkably, Freud didn't link Oedipus to Africa. And this particularity gives a key for a second event, which took place at the beginning of the 20th century with the discovery of Akhenaten. The place of Akhenaten in the history of Egypt is striking. He reigns at the peak of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, which is the highest of all empires in the ancient world. Hence, his predecessor, his father, is the wealthiest pharaoh in the history of Egypt. His wife, she is the most well-known queen, Nefertiti. One of his sons, nobody less than the famous Tutankhamun, his principal successor, the illustrious pharaoh Ramses II, after whom Egypt began a continuous decline. So, surrounded by the most famous figure in Egyptology, Akhenaten had been forgotten, though he established the first monotheism in Egypt and in the, the ancient world. He also had attempted a unique international policy when he built a solar capital in the name of his god Atom. But in the midst of intense difficulties, he was threatened and suddenly disappeared. There is no information about his death. His mummy has never been found so far, and his tomb was never occupied. Remarkably, there are strong indications that Akhenaten was Hebrew by his mother. And after his disappearance from Egypt, History shows the birth of Israel and Athens with the first league of Delos. Meanwhile, his deserted city is razed to the ground. He is deleted from the records that Egyptians kept so well of their kings. And under Ramses II, his successor, to pronounce his name could be punishable by death. With all these indications about both Akhenaten and Hermes Trismegistus, who, by the way, had built, so as I said before, this solar city, which was called by the Middle Ages Adosantin, like the center of Ado, Adon, 
which Adonai or Adonis, which is another name for Aton, and Aton is. So, one must think that Hermes Trismegistus must have been the memory of Akhenaten. But things are not so easy, and they reflect a rigorous process that reign on the principle of substantiation of our memories. I shall explain this with the help of an imaginary scenario. Let's imagine that someone has the memory of a bookshop with a blue door and a sun painted on the window in a street where the Dalai Lama went down when he visited the United Nations at a certain date. But who knows where this memory comes from? Memories are like dreams. They are virtual. They may have no reality and be mere illusions, in fact. Let's continue to imagine that, concurrently, a historian may discover with documents, map, photographies, that at the time, at this time of this visit of the Dalai Lama, there was in the same street where he passed down a bookshop with a blue door and the sun painted in the window. This scientist may say that this historical fact has nothing to do with the previous memory which may still be a phantasm. This is exactly what historians have first said when they have been in position to compare Hermes Trismegistus with Akhenaten. For a first law rules the process of substantiation of memories, which is the coincidence between the memories virtual images with an historical place, an address, so to speak. This is a requisite, whatsoever may be the amount of details and resemblance of the qualities between memories and facts. This requirement is fulfilled in the case of Hermes Trismegistus. For the father of the church took their reference for Trismegistus in the city where Hermes has been worshipped in the year prior to Christianity, which is Hermopolis Magna, which had been built exactly at the same place where stood previously the city of Akhenaten. Hermopolis Bagna may have been built 300 years prior to Christianity, and the city of Akhenaten uh, a little bit more than 1,000 years before Christus. That means that Hermopolis Bagna had been built, the uh, of what people may have been have memory had been built exactly at the same address on the Nile. Same address, so to speak. So, once our eyes open to this, just and only this now is definitely guaranteeing the substantiation of Hermes Trismegistus as Akhenaten. This process of substantiation of memories shows a second law that is of multiplicity. For the longer a repression lasts, the more it gives emergence to substitute figure in the place of the repressed origin. This is typically a fundamental observation of Freud and psychoanalysis. This multiplicity has been demonstrated in 1960 by Immanuel Velikovsky when he achieved the identification 
of Oedipus with Akhenaten. Based on the large amount of information given by Sophocles and other authors, which match the data which is later recovered by Egyptology, Emmanuel Velikovsky showed that Oedipus and Akhenaten are one and the same person. Therefore, we can write the equation of three substantiation now. Akhenaten égal equal Oedipus. Hermestris Megistus equal Akhenaten equal Oedipus. Then we see the continuation of this law of uh, uh, multiplicity. For with the previous history of Trismegistus, we can attach Orpheus to the equation. Therefore, we have Hermes Trismegistus equal, equal Orpheus, equal Akhenaten, equal Oedipus. Even the legendary Phaeton in Greece a semi-god is another substitute who can link to the chain to the chain and become substantiated. Fiat. We are ready to sum up the full detail memory recovery which took place during the 20th century. The display of the law of multiplicity has started with Sigmund Freud, who began with its resistance. After the discovery of Akhenaten in 1910, Freud is the first author who bring close Akhenaten to Moses. He saw them as the master and the disciple. Meanwhile, as said earlier, he underlines the Greek memory with Oedipus in relation to monotheism, but he keeps it aloof from Africa. Thus, Freud has re-established in the 20th century the typical pre-Renaissance structure of realism, of memory, when Hermes Trismegistus was related but separated from Moses and the Hellenic representation. As said earlier, 30 years later, in 1960, after Freud 1930, Velikovsky substantiated the missing link to Hellenism. Therefore, 15 years after, in 1985, when I resumed Freud's analysis and brought Moses and Akhenaten even closer up to making them one and the same person, I was shifting and re-establishing the Renaissance structure of realism when Moses was identified to Hermes Trismegistus, the pharaoh king of Egypt. With the difference this time that nowadays the Hellenic link is well substantiated. Instead of a logic of duality, which is with its discarding and destructive consequences, I could describe a triple identification. Akhenaten, Moses, Oedipus. And actually, I was rapidly able to integrate Hermes Trismegistus and thus completing Hermes Orpheus. Trismegistus, Akhenaten, Orpheus, Oedipus, Phaeton, Moses, all these names designate one and the same person, following the law of multiple substitutes, which emerge into a psychohistory during the latent phase of memory. 
all this was done with the sole support of plural analysis, a system that I have developed as part of my practice and that I apply to the recovery of collective memory. But in 1985, I had no expertise in hard Egyptology. In 1990, I met Hamed Osman, to whom I yield the platform. Thank you, Dr. William. <clears throat> now, the, the identity of Akhenaten and the relationship between Akhenaten and the biblical character of Moses uh, haunted me the same way uh, as Dr. William when I first read the book of, uh, uh, of Sigmund Freud, in, uh, which he wrote in 1939, and he called Moses uh, and the monotheism. Uh, the reason for me to start searching was different than the reason of Dr. William, because as I was growing up in Egypt, I'm Egyptian, although now living in London, uh, I realized that uh, my people in Egypt were in a continuous uh, conflict with the new nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this conflict uh, was not just uh, like any other political conflict, that it must have uh, some deeper roots uh, that make these people uh, uh, hate each other and fight each other without being able to just sit down and talk and solve their problem. So instead of <coughs> joining the, the fighting or the conflict, I left Egypt and I went to London in 1965 in an attempt to start to, to find the roots of the common history, because after all, Moses was born in Egypt, and the Israelites became a nation <coughs> in Egypt. So I thought in, in Egypt, in the common history of the two nations, that we can find the roots of the problem. And I have to start uh, looking in the history. If, if the question came to me, if these stories of Joseph Moses and all these characters was really a historical account, not just um, mythology or theology or something, then we should have some evidence of it from Egyptian historical sources. So I started to look. Uh, in the beginning, I assumed that this uh, problem should have been solved by some other uh, scholars, biblical scholars or historians, Egyptologists. But uh, in fact, when I came to London first, I realized that this problem, although been attempted, many people attempted to solve it, but they could not come to a, some kind of, of solid uh, result, connecting, uh, identifying biblical characters from Egyptian sources. So I had to start working from the scratch. So I, although I was working during the day, I had to learn in the evening, first Egyptian history for three years, then Egyptian language for another three years, then the Bible and the Hebrew language for some years. It took me about 25 years before I started to see uh, some light. And the light came to me very strangely, <laughs> in fact, uh, in one night, because one night, in, maybe in 1997 or something, uh, it was very cold uh, winter, and uh, at about three or four o'clock in the morning, I got up. I didn't want to disturb my wife, so I went to the kitchen. I had some tea, and I sat by the fire in the sitting room, and I started reading the Bible, the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph. And then, uh, at that moment, 
uh, I came to the story when the Joseph's brother came to Egypt for the second time to buy corn, and then he invited them to have uh, a meal in his house. I, uh, up to that moment, they didn't know that he was their brother. But uh, he came to an emotional kind of situation, so he asked his Egyptian uh, guards an assistant to leave them he alone with his guests and then he addressed them and uh, and he revealed his true identity to them I am Joseph your brother in this moment uh, they felt a little bit uh, ashamed of themselves what they did to him and they tried to apologize for what happened so he said it was not you who brought me hither to Egypt it was God and he made me father to Pharaoh. In fact, I had read this story many times before because when you look and look and look, you, you don't find, you keep looking. So I had read this story many times before, but only that moment, on that night, I could see that father to Pharaoh was an Egyptian title. How can Joseph say, uh, God made me father to Pharaoh. I mean, it is not the normal way. The biblical narrator could not have invented this because it's not a part of the normal invention story, you see. And father to Pharaoh was an Egyptian title, but it's a very rare Egyptian title. Usually, any minister or any noble working for the king was called the son of Pharaoh, which, whatever age he was. If, if he was very old, the minister and the king was very young, still they say the, the, the king's son for Upper Egypt, the king's son for Lower Egypt, the king's son for, it's a title in Egypt. But the king's father is, a, the, of the father of the king is very rare title in ancient Egypt. And immediately it came to my mind the character of Yuya. Yuya was a, a minister uh, uh, to Amenhotep III. And I remember that he had this title, Eat Netter en Neptali. Eat is father, Netter is uh, holy, holy or, or God, it can be God, but in this case it's a holy, holy father. Eat Netter is holy father. Nep, Neptali, Neb is Lord, Tawi is the two lands. The holy father of the lords of the two lands. This is the title that you had. Immediately it came to my mind the connection for the first time. So early in the morning I went to the library and they got the book of Yuya's tomb. Yuya's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, which is very strange for somebody who is not of the royal uh, family himself. And uh, he, he, in 1905 uh, uh, Davies uh, found his tomb in, in, in the Valley of the Kings, he and his wife. Uh, so I, I got the book and they started to look, and then everything started to fit with, with the character. First of all, if you take the name Yu, yeah, in fact, it was written in the tomb in too many ways. Uh, Yaya, Yayu, Yu, Ya, Yu only, and so on. So Maspero, who was responsible for archaeology at the time of discovering the tomb in Egypt, he concluded that this guy must be a foreign person because if he was an ordinary Egyptian person, they would have known his name and written it uh, consistently. Uh, uh, and if you look at the name, you find uh, uh, all uh, parts of it, you, uh, uh, you, ya, yi, in three cases, you or ya or yi, you see. Egyptians usually relate people to, in their names to their deity, you see, and here, we have you, which is Jehovah or Yahweh, uh, in, in, in all the cases, which is very strange. And then uh, the Bible says that when, uh, when uh, the king of Egypt appointed Joseph as his minister, he gave him an Egyptian name. And this name starts with Seph. Seph net Ba'an is Seph, you see. So I realized that the name of Joseph is a compound name. You was uh, his uh, original Hebrew name, and Seth was the name given to him by Egypt, uh, Egyptian king, you see. And then again, 
uh, Manitho, who, the historian who wrote the Egyptian uh, history in the third century BC for the Ptolemies, uh, referred to a minister of Amenhotep uh, III uh, calling him Seth. Uh, again, so uh, it, it became uh, clear to me that Yosef, Joseph, or Yosef uh, is, is uh, from the, this phonetic uh, name side is, is, is agrees. Then again, when I looked at, at, the, at the story of the Bible, it says that when uh, the king appointed Joseph as his uh, minister, he gave him three objects. He gave him his ring, and he gave him a, a golden necklace, and he gave him his old chariot. In the tomb of Yuya, we found that Yuya has the ring and has a title, the holder of the king's ring for Lower Egypt. And then we have the golden necklace. You can see it in the Cairo Museum, if you want to see it. And then we have a chariot, which is a small chariot, could not have been for Yuya. It is a small chariot which is not his. So all the three objects mentioned by, by the Bible uh, to have been given to you, you, Joseph, uh, Joseph, who is found in the U.S. tomb. So uh, then uh, again, uh, the uh, anatomist, uh, Elliot Smith, who has discovered the mummy, immediately recognized that this is not usual, the usual kind of uh, ethnic uh, group that was the rest of the Egyptians. And if we, if you, any of you would uh, see, have a look at the mummy, which is the best preserved mummy in ancient Egypt, you will find that if you need only one look to recognize that he must be a Semitic uh, origin, you see. So, uh, uh, what happened is that it, it, by giving uh, uh, Joseph uh, his chariot, uh, the king giving him a chariot, he was in fact uh, appointing him responsible for the chariots because the king would not give uh, his minister on the coronation day uh, of his office uh, an object uh, if it does not represent the office he's giving him. So in fact, Yuya was uh, appointed as the, uh, the, the the king is lieutenant for the chariots. Uh, this is one of the, his uh, offices. Uh, now, uh, the Bible says that Joseph had two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. Yuya had two sons, but Yuya had also one daughter. So I had to see if the Bible have a, a mention of a daughter. There's no daughter mentioned to Joseph in the Bible, but there's a very strange coincidence because they, the Bible says that when, when Jacob came to Egypt with his family, they were 70 people. Nevertheless, in another place, when they mentioned the names of the 70 people, we only have uh, 69. In fact, 67, uh, and they say, uh, uh, 67, yes, and they say, add Manasseh and Ephraim, born to uh, Egypt, uh, so 79 and one, person is missing, which is very strange. And then again, when the Joseph uh, uh, wanted to bury his father Jacob in, in Canaan, uh, he had to go to the king's wife uh, to ask her to talk to Pharaoh uh, and ask him to allow Joseph to bury, which was very strange because Joseph was appointed by, by the king, why doesn't he spoke, speak to him directly? If, 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 the, if it indicates that the queen was nearer to him than the king, so he has to ask her to intervene. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, I was able to, uh, to see that, uh, that the biblical character of, of Joseph could be the same character of Yuya. The only thing is that the time that uh, uh, usually uh, Egyptologists or biblical scholars agreed for Joseph was different. Now, what happened was that the early scholars looking for identifying biblical stories in Egypt took information uh, they found in 
Egypt, and they tried to fit it into the chronology of the Bible. And I think there they found uh, this, this is their mistake, because uh, they could not find any character, any connections. Because the Bible gives us, being a, a theological work, work, not a historical work, and being transmitted orally for many generations before, I mean, from the time of Moses, 14th century BC, to the Babylonian exile, 6th century BC, about eight centuries before it was written down. Obviously, especially figures and names tend to get confused. So what I decided to do is to fit uh, instead biblical stories into Egyptian chronology. The Bible has two contradicting accounts of the time we expect for Joseph in Egypt. Uh, the Exodus account, I think it is in chapter 30, 13 of Exodus, says after they have left Egypt into Sinai, the, and the sojourn of the Israelites was for 430 years. 430 years, four centuries and 30 years. Uh, and this uh, is a long time. But we have another account, I think, in chapter 15 of the book of Genesis. And this, in, in a vision, the Lord talks to Abraham and tell him that your descendants will be uh, uh, strangers in uh, uh, another land, which is Egypt, and the fourth generation will come back hither. The fourth generation will come. So it's four generations between the time the, the descendants of Abraham go to Egypt uh, the fourth generation will come out. And four generations could not possibly be, have been 430 years. The, there is a contradiction. And if we look at, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, generations given in the Bible, we find in four. I mean, we find uh, Levi, uh, Kohath, uh, Amram, and Moses, four generations. But if we were to add the, I mean, I, I, I realize how, how the 430 years came uh, to be mistaken uh, in this case, because if you add the total ages of these four generations, I think Kohath uh, uh, Levi lived 130, 37 years, and Kohath 133 years, uh, uh, and uh, Imram 133 years, I think, as well, uh, and Moses 120 years. If we add this together, we, we come to about 590 something. And then if we were to deduct the age that Levi lived in Canaan before coming to Egypt, which is 53 years, and the age which Moses lived after the Exodus, which is 40 years, we come exactly to 430 years. So the 430 years is not really uh, uh, the, the time of the, of the uh, sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt, but it is a total uh, figure of the ages of the four generation what they spent in Egypt according to the Bible. So I did not uh, take this four and twenty years as uh, as historically uh, binding. You see, so it is four generations. So once I have been able to establish a, a biblical character for Egyptian sources, it started the whole uh, thing started to open. One more point before I, I, I leave, because it is important if you have to see it in a historical term. Now, uh, the only, I mean, if, if the only mention of uh, Israel in Egypt came in the fifth year of Pharaoh Merembeda, who is the son of Ramses II and his successor. Ramses II ruled Egypt for about six, uh, 67 years, and when he died, he was about 96 years old, and he's followed by his 13th son. He had many sons and daughters. His number 13 was lucky this time, and he followed his father. But when he came to the throne, he was about 60 years of age. And in the fifth year of Merembita's reign, about 1200 something BC, uh, Egypt was attacked by a coalition of tribes from uh, the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean uh, islands and Libyan. Uh, people, and they came and attacked Egypt. And the uh, Pharaoh of Berembeta sent his army and engaged them, and he defeated them. And he had a large stela, 
uh, and he wrote all the account of the fighting with the Libyans. And then at the bottom, he has few lines. He mentioned the situation, how he, uh, Egypt in his time, is already uh, defeating all other nations. So he mentioned some nations in Canaan, uh, in Syria and, and Canaan, as being defeated. And among these, we have the word Israel, and then we have a man and a woman indicating that they were people, nomadic or semi-nomadic, not yet established in a, a city or a town. So this is the only uh, reference we have of Israel in Egyptian sources. Uh, uh, traditionally, Egyptologists and biblical scholars uh, started from this point and counted 430 years before uh, to, to decide uh, the, uh, the time of, of, of Joseph. And obviously, we came here to the time when the Hyksos were ruling Egypt at the very beginning of that. They didn't find everything, anything, of, of course, because they looked in the wrong place, in my view. Now, one of the reasons they accepted the, the fact that Joseph could have come uh, with the, uh, during the Hyksos time is that the idea was uh, that prevailed that the, these Hyksos, Egypt was ruled by some foreign powers between the mid 17th century BC and the mid 16th century BC for about 100 years. And these people were called Hyksos and the idea until recently that they were, came from Canaan and they uh, subdued the Delta first, then the rest of Egypt for 100 years until they were driven out by uh, Ahmos who established the 18th dynasty and then uh, his, his descendants or followers, successors uh, made the empire uh, between uh, the Euphrates and, and the River Nile. Uh, because the idea was, now the, the Egyptians before that time did not know the horse. Maybe one horse was found or something somewhere, bones of horse were found, but usually they used uh, the, the, the donkeys and uh, not the horse. They didn't know the horse. The horse was coming from Central Asia and it arrived to Mesopotamia and so on, but it did not arrive to Egypt before the Hyksos time. With the Hyksos coming from uh, the, the, the east, uh, we start to find the horse in Egypt, uh, 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 abandoned uh, numbers. And uh, it was assumed, because in the 18th dynasty, uh, the Egyptians had the chariot uh, for the first time, it was assumed that the Hyksos must have introduced a chariot to Egypt, and that this is the uh, military uh, power that helped them to conquer Egypt. But nowadays, they, uh, and because Joseph is in the Joseph story of the Bible, uh, we have no name of any king or any city to identify his time, but because there's three mentions of chariots in his story, it was assumed that this is the Hyksos period. Uh, Joseph, when he's appointed to his position, he was given a chariot by the king. And Joseph, again, when his father came, Jacob, uh, from Canaan, he went out uh, in his chariot uh, uh, to welcome his father. And then again, when Jacob himself died, it is said in the story that uh, Joseph took the chariots all together and went out to bury his father in Bateman's stream uh, in, in southern uh, Palestine or Canaan at the time. So all this, uh, and, and obviously the, the biblical narrator will not invent something like chariots. It must have been part of the story. Uh, the, 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 he can invent things if he wants to edit the story, but there are things you cannot really invent unless you find evidence of it in, in, the, in the original story. Uh, so, the, because of these chariots, they uh, accepted this, uh, the account that it was in during the Hyksos. But nowadays, after all the sites of the Hyksos in Egypt have been excavated, we know that, uh, in fact, the Hyksos did not bring chariots with them, because there's no remains of chariots, there's no uh, scene, drawn scene of a chariot, there's no text with a chariot in it, and the uh, text with, which we have of, from the Egyptian side uh, of the liberation war against the Hyksos mentions horses, but does not mention 
uh, any chariot. So the idea that the chariots uh, were uh, came with the Hyksos nowadays is not uh, verified at all. So in fact, Joseph could not have come during the Hyksos period. He must have came during the period of the 18th dynasty. So this is only to confirm more that Joseph and Yuya uh, must have been one and the same person. Now, now we come to the, I mean, this was the subject of my first book, uh, Stranger in the Valley of the Kings. So I defy Yuya uh, and as being Joseph of the Bible. Now I came to the second step, which my friend Dr. William is interested in, the Moses uh, uh, Akhenaten situation. Uh, one very strange thing happened in Egypt at the time uh, that created the whole story, the whole conflict. Yuya had a daughter called Tai. And I mean, Hoti the third, it must be, fell in love with this, with this girl. Now, the king of Egypt could marry any number of women he wants. In fact, I mean, Hoti the third had 300 women in his harem, exactly the same way as, as uh, uh, Solomon. Uh, but uh, the thing is, his queen, his main wife, his queen, whose children will succeed the father on the throne must be the heiress because the throne in Egypt was uh, the line of the throne goes went through the female line not the male line so whoever marries the eldest daughter of the king will have the right to follow that king on the throne that's why the prince usually married his sister to gain the right to the throne because if every anybody else were, would marry her he will be, have the right to the throne. It's only within the royal family that the, uh, a man married his sister be, to keep the line within the family. Uh, so uh, in this case, when uh, I mean, Hoti the third married the uh, uh, Yuya's daughter, or Joseph's daughter, uh, the priesthood would not allow her to be the queen. The king wanted her to be the queen. He insisted that this is my queen. But according to tradition, although Pharaoh was a little bit of a dictator, uh, in, in, now in our mind we think him as a dictator, but he was not a dictator in fact, uh, because he was uh, regarded as son of God, but he has to abide by the rules uh, and traditions of, of the people. So in this case, he was challenged by the priesthood who told him this is not possible. But the king at that time, he was powerful, Egypt was the richest country and the most powerful country in the thing, and he was uh, proud of himself and he uh, insisted. So the, 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 this marriage resulted in, in a son called Tutmosis. We have some uh, a, a reference to him in, from the tomb of Tutankhamun. And he, the king appointed him as his successor, as his heir. Some time shortly afterwards, this uh, young uh, Totmos disappears completely. And we can only assume how he disappeared because the priesthood would not allow mm -hmm. the son of, of this uh, lady to, to follow uh, uh, his father on the throne. Now, after that, the second son after that was uh, Akhenaten, in fact. He, he was not called Akhenaten at the time of his birth, but eventually he, he was. He was born as uh, Amenhotep the Fourth as his father. Now we can now imagine how the thing, uh, the story of the Bible uh, about Moses' birth came. Because uh, now the, uh, usually the uh, the royal uh, palace is in Memphis, uh, the capital city for religious reasons and so on was Thebes in Upper Egypt, Luxor uh, of modern times, but. The residence, royal residence, usually is not far from Cairo, uh, on the west side of the Nile. It's called Memphis. Usually, the royal palace is there, and they, they live there. And there was a, a border city uh, in uh, near the Kantara area, in northern Sinai, uh, a border fortified city called Zaro. Uh, when the uh, Joseph asked his father. 
uh, ask uh, Pharaoh to allow his father and his family to come to Egypt. The Pharaoh accepted, agreed, but he did not allow them to settle in Egypt proper because of the previous uh, Hyksos experience. Uh, e uh, Egyptian king was afraid that uh, some uh, foreign power might take uh, over again. So he allowed them a border location. The Bible called the land of Goshen. This is not an Egyptian name, but uh, the Bible called it Goshen. But it was near, is the same location as the city, both the city of Zaro in northern Sinai. And one more confirmation of the fact that the relationship between Yuya, uh, between Yuya uh, and his daughter Tai, Queen Tai, and the Israelites is that at that moment uh, of history, Amenhotep III gives this city of Zaro, uh, at the border city, which is surrounded uh, by villages uh, of the Goshen area, uh, to his wife, uh, uh, Queen Tai. Why should the king do that and, and have a palace for her to reside in this area during the summer and so on? Why should this king do that? Obviously, in my interpretation, because her father's family, the Israelites, were residing in the same area, and he wanted to allow her the chance to meet uh, her family, to be with her family some part of the year. Uh, now, this uh, location, we have the uh, Ismailia uh, in the south, and Poseidon in the north. We have a lake in the north, Manzala, and the lake uh, Timsah in the south. And the two lakes uh, at the ancient times came very close to each other. And then again, we have uh, the Egyptian built a, a, a kind of a canal between the two lakes. So in fact, the, this uh, Zaro, this uh, Goshen area was completely isolated uh, from the rest of Egypt. And the only way to get to Egypt is to cross a bridge and this bridge has a border guard uh, to, to guard it, you see. And then it was a lake area. Many lakes were in this area, you see. Now, uh, again, we have to go to Sigmund Freud. Freud suggested in his book, uh, the first part of his book, he, he suggested that Moses must have been an Egyptian. Uh, and uh, the reason for that, he said that the birth of Moses, the story of his birth in the Bible, follows a prototype of a, a birth of, he, of a hero in different mythology of ancient nations, like Romulus, who built Rome, and like Agad of, of, of the Agadians, uh, and like uh, Oedipus, uh, who, uh, when we, all these stories, we have some family of a high status, a king or a prince, uh, are, are attacked and destroyed by f somebody who wants to take over. And usually, if, uh, if somebody wants to take over, he makes sure that he uh, kills all the members of the ruling family. Because if he leaves one person, they will come later on to, to claim their right again. So he makes sure that. So usually, uh, the, the, a baby or, or, or born will be smuggled away and kept away uh, uh, with some poor family until he grows up and uh, realizes who he really is and goes back to, the, to demand uh, his rights and, and claim his, his right and avenge his father. This is the usual story. Uh, uh, a, a, a baby, uh, a boy from a high status family uh, is threatened. His life is threatened, so he is smuggled to live with, uh, be brought up in a, a, a poor family, and, uh, and then when he grows up, he goes back uh, to, the, to ask uh, for his right. Only in the story uh, of the Bible, the Moses account, of, uh, that the story, according to uh, Freud, was switched. Uh, the, the, the boy is born to a Hebrew, uh, poor family and being brought up in the palace. Uh, he said this must, must be uh, a deliberate uh, attempt by the narrator of the Bible to hide the fact that uh, the leader was, uh, of the Israelites was in fact Egyptian. So uh, if we were to look at the story again, we find now 
uh, we don't have here a, a historical kind of evidence, but we have to have a little bit of imagination here. Uh, after the, the killing of the first uh, son born to Queen Tai from her husband, uh, now she is expecting another child. Uh, what would the king do? He was in conflict with his priesthood. He loves his wife. So uh, we can expect uh, within this frame how the king will ask the midwives if, uh, the, if, the, if the child is a, is a boy to kill it without letting the mother know uh, and if it was a, a, a girl to leave it. Obviously, it was not an order as such because we know from the Bible as, as well that the midwives did not obey Pharaoh. In fact, they went and uh, warned the queen. And then what would the queen do? She, obviously, she would try to uh, smuggle her, 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 her son uh, uh, to safety. And there was a lake between the palace and the villages where the Israelites live in the other side. It is natural. And so the, the, the situation was completely different. The, the, in my understanding, the baby was born in the palace and the, his mother was the queen. And she was wanted to smuggle him out of the palace to her, uh, her father's uh, family on the other side so that he can be brought up safely. Uh, uh, it is not uh, understood, if you, if you look at the story as, as it is in the Bible now, you find it a little bit confusing, unconvincing, because how would a mother who is a frightened uh, for her, the life of her child from Pharaoh's soldiers will take her, her son and put it next to the palace? So the, the daughter of Pharaoh, I mean, the, she would have to take him some way. As anyhow, uh, the, it is uh, uh, evident the possibility here that, in fact, the child was born in, in the palace. Now, we ha have no information. Usually, uh, the, the prince of Egypt usually is brought up with the uh, educated in Memphis with the rest of the high class uh, members of the, of the society. And he is trained uh, for uh, uh, horse riding and fighting and, and this sort of thing as well as in Memphis, usually he gets his education. But we have no knowledge of uh, uh, Akhenaten uh, at all being there. And from the later uh, way, he constructed his temple to Aten uh, and, and the worship uh, rituals and so on, we can detect that he must have been educated in another place in, in, in uh, Heliopolis. Now, Queen Tai had two uh, Brothers, one of them was a priest of Heliopolis, uh, of, of Ra'at Heliopolis. He is called Anin, and it is most probably that it was uh, his her brother Anin that who, who kept uh, uh, young uh, Akhenaten and taught him. Now, we only find so first of all the the location of the birth of of, of Moses is the very same location of the birth of Akhenaten. We know that because uh, uh, in the year 11 of Amin Hotu III uh, rule, we have a, 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 a large scarab indicating, in a way, that Amin Hotu III took his wife to this city of Zaro, and they were uh, on the lake having a, a kind of a second honeymoon. And the result of that was the birth of, of, of uh, Akhenaten in the same location of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the border city uh, where uh, Goshen, where Moses is supposed to have lived. And at the time, by the way, the royal palace usually was in Upper Egypt or in Memphis. But this is a very strange thing because this palace was only there for the summertime and for the queen to be there to have a chance to get. Uh, this is not the lo real location. Later on, in the Exodus, we find that the whole Egyptian royal family moved to the north, but in the, in the early time it was, it was not. This is a very strange uh, coincidence. Now, uh, in his year 16, when he reached 16 years of age, suddenly we find uh, uh, Akhenaten appearing uh, in Thebes. Now, uh, uh, his father, uh, uh, because he wanted him to be sure that he, 
he, his son will follow him at the throne, appointed him then as a co-regent. The priesthood did not like it, and they made it very clear, because we know that from texts that Akhenaten wrote on the boulder uh, stones he put later on, on his, for his new city. He, he said uh, very clearly that he, he, he was attacked, and his father was attacked, although he was a king, because uh, of this conflict. It was very clear there was a conflict. The reason of the conflict that the priesthood did not regard uh, 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 him uh, as the legal son of Amun, because the Egyptians regarded the king as the son of their deity, in this case, the son of Amun. And the reason for that, they have a reason for that, the reason for that, when, when the king, before the king goes to bed with his wife, usually he goes, I mean for the first time, for, uh, he goes to the temple and he's going to be purified by holy water and then they start chanting some chants and making some rituals, uh, demanding, uh, asking the, the spirit of, of the God, of the deity, to come and dwell in the, in the physical body of the king. When they think this has been uh, done, then they, they put the, the, the headdress of, of Amun on his head, uh, identifying him as such, and then he goes in. So the result of, 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 the, of this communication will, will be uh, the son of Amun, you see. But they uh, believe that if the woman, if the, of the, if the wife of the, of the king was not the heiress, Amun will not come. The spirit of Amun will not come. So no communication. So that's why, uh, because Tai uh, was not the heiress, uh, they did not identify her son as being the son of Amun. What uh, the response of, of Akhenaten here was completely the opposite. He told him, all right, I am not the son of Amun, who is Amun? Uh, and then at the same time, he just c completely produced his new uh, god. He said that Aton is one god, and this Aton is for all people, and he has no image. For the first time in history, we have this declaration, because before that, even among the early Israelites, they identified one god for themselves, but they accepted that other nations could have other gods. Akhenaten did not accept that. He said one god for Egypt and for the south, countries in the south and countries in the north. This god for the first time, because this was completely against the conception of, of uh, ancient countries, because in the ancient world, each people have their own god to defend them against other people. So if it's one god for everybody, so the conflict becomes impossible. So this is the first time in history that we have this uh, declaration made. So obviously, and the Egyptian priests would not have found, uh, I mean, find it very difficult to accept one more god in the uh, uh, world of gods. But he, uh, uh, he refused them to come to his temple. If anybody who does not denounce the other gods would not be allowed. And the word Aton is obviously the T in Egyptian becomes D in Hebrew. Adon, the Lord, or Adonai is the same as, again, Sigmund Freud uh, 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 argued that Adonai is Aton, is the same God. Uh, he, uh, I, I remember uh, what he said is uh, he said that the declaration uh, in the Bible, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elohora, uh, El Adonai, Ohod, uh, listen, O Israel, uh, our uh, God Adonai, Atun, is uh, the one God. Uh, so the thing is, uh, the, 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 the priesthood did not accept it. They refused to accept it. So he was forced to leave the city uh, of Thebes, and he went to uh, a, a, another place between halfway between uh, modern Cairo and, and Luxor, it, it, which is known now as Amarna, and he built a new town and a new city for himself and his followers where he practiced 
his own uh, uh, theology and philosophy and whatever it is. Now, as long as his father lived, Akhenaten was an outsider left alone. Until his father died after in the 12th year of the co-regency, then Akhenaten became the king of Egypt alone. He would not allow, now that he is the king, any other god to be worshipped in Egypt. So he sent the troops, the army troops, to close all the temples, to sack all the priesthood, to confiscate all the lands of the temple, and to change the name of the plural word for gods into the singular, and to cut Amun's name wherever they find it. The idea of one god for everybody, for me and my enemy, for instance, or me, for everybody, one god with no image was a very kind of an, uh, intellectual abstract idea, which is very difficult for people at the time to accept. So Ak Akhenaten did not have too many followers at the time. He was not able to reach the people. And eventually, the army officers whom he sent to, the, to, to, to close the temples started to uh, rebel against him. Uh, there was an attempt to make a compromise. I will finish in five minutes. But uh, the com he would not compromise. Akhenaten would not compromise. So what happened was, I suggested when I wrote the book in 1990, that there was an attempt of a coup d'etat against him, and he was forced to abdicate power. In fact, uh, Professor Alan Zivi, who was a French uh, archaeologist, found a tomb in, uh, of Maya, the, 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 the nanny of Tutankhamun, uh, last year in Saqqara. And uh, uh, Tutankhamun is sitting on the lap of, of his nanny, uh, and behind uh, the, the, the seat, we have six ministers of Tutankhamun. Five of them are generals in the army, and only one civilian, which is a minister of finance. The other five were generals in the army. And four of these generals followed Akhenaten on the throne. I, Horemheb, Ramses, Bar Ramses, Ramses I, and Seti I. So it is very strong evidence of a coup d'etat that forced Akhenaten, the army itself rebelled, to abdicate power to Tutankhamun. And in, uh, 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 there is evidence there that in, in, in an area not far from Mount Sinai, in Sinai, 15 kilometers north uh, west of Mount Sinai, in another mount called Sarabit al Khadim, uh, which had a, a temple there, cave temple, uh, the evidence that uh, Akhenaten, in fact, uh, lived there during some years of exile and then came back uh, to the mount, uh, uh, the throne afterwards. I think I have uh, taken more than my time, so. Uh, this is the usual thing. I think that uh, Akhenaten uh, and Moses are to be identified as, as the one and the same person. Thank you. intensely as we have uh, in the past several months, but uh, I, I, I claim two titles, and I guess that's why I'm here today. Uh, number, the first title is that I'm uh, Ahmed Osman's number one student, <laughs> and then the second one is that I'm the most repressed man in the most repressed country of the world, so <laughs> that's uh, William's side of the, <laughs> of the story. Um, I come from uh, a Christian background. Um, I'm a preacher's kid. <laughs> 
So I studied the Bible from the, that perspective uh, most of my life. Uh, uh, decided not to follow my father as a minister, but to uh, go into engineering. Um, I was very frustrated most of my life. It's, uh, and uh, had a very emotional salvation experience early in my life uh, that has really shaped who I am uh, because it was uh, a very, it's been a very um, uh, sensitive existence uh, that, that put, uh, instilled something in me that was very sensitive to God and uh, something that I could never get away from. And, uh, as my life went on, things began to get more and more painful. And, you know, when there's chronic pain in your life, there, that's a signal typically that there's something wrong. You know, it's either you've got a genetic problem or a, um, you've got, uh, you know, your, your mental situation isn't what it should be. But, I, you know, I've pushed it aside and, and I just kept, you know, kept chugging. But until the point, uh, you know, I was in a bad marriage and uh, uh, it all came to a head and I just, really started to uh, uh, break. And at that point, uh, I decided to, to go back and, and see if I could find anything historical about my faith. And uh, didn't expect to find anything at all. And <laughs> so the fact that I'm here is uh, somewhat of a miracle in itself. Uh, um, I wrote uh, some summaries of Ahmed's work because I, I've, I've thought that that was the most outstanding uh, biblical, historical, archaeological um, synergy that I had come across anywhere, and I really searched diligently for it. Um, and I pretty much left that alone uh, uh, until this past fall. I did the website for Ahmed. Uh, he's already has a couple of others, but uh, I consider uh, my uh, summaries probably the most comprehensive of, of his works, and I. I would encourage you to get a card from me later if you want to uh, check that out. I think Harvey uh, took a look at it uh, the other night and uh, gave me some good fe feedback on it. Um, but uh, out of the blue last fall, I guess it was early December, um, it sent me an email. He said, go to Dr. Tho's website and check out his review of my new book. And so I did that evening. And uh, I read his review and I was just very, very impressed. I just I thought uh, he's really, he really has something additional to say about this issue. Uh, his previous uh, review of Ahmed's third book was very uh, severe, and I kind of was upset with him about that. But uh, uh, his, his latest review, he came around, and I think he was beginning to accept some of Ahmed's ideas as well. And uh, at that point, uh, you know, I immediately recognized there was something there in the Greek side of the story that had that needed to be brought out and and combined with the biblical side that they really were different faces of the same person um, as William brought out um, so uh, since since that email uh, in December I don't think I've had a, a full night's sleep <laughs> until now and uh, the the insights that have come out of uh, bringing those two streams of research together have just been incredible. Um, I'll just give you maybe a, a few examples. Uh, uh, in the in the Oedipus, Oedipus plays, the, the wife and also the mother of, um, of Oedipus is named Jocast. In the Bible, her name, or the, the mother of Moses, is given as uh, Jochebed. If you look at the two words, you know, there's some similar similarities in, right off the bat, you know, with the, the first two letters. However, if you do the word study, this uh, Greek word, cast, is our English word, caste system, uh, means rank or our nobility, that kind of thing. Uh, this, this word here, is the Hebrew kabed, which has an identical meaning. It means uh, status, honor, wealth, um, rank, those kind of uh, meanings. And so we have a direct correspondence there uh, between the mother of Moses in the Bible and the mother of uh, Oedipus in, in Sophocles' work. Um, 
there's another, uh, Ahmed mentioned the, uh, the vizier I, who um, was standing behind Tutankhamun, who also uh, served during Ak Akhenaten's reign. And uh, he is also uh, uh, mentioned in the Bible as well and in the Oedipus play. And I'll, I'll bring out uh, kind of a word study there. Uh, in in um, Oedipus, the, the brother of uh, Moses' mother, of the brother of Joe Cast, his name is uh, Creon. In the, uh, in the Bible, um, one of uh, the names for Moses' father-in-law is uh, Jethro. And, you know, on the surface, you know, there would seem to be no correspondence between those two names. However, in the Hebrew, one of the um, forms for Jethro in the Hebrew is Ithra, which is obviously Egyptian in, uh, in derivation. Uh, the, the one form of Jethro is a Hebrew and, and the other is, is Egyptian. Um, and this literally means uh, increase. The ith is a, an Egyptian word that men enlarge men or, or increase. And then Ra, of course, is the Egyptian sun god. Uh, Creon, uh, if you break up the roots on that, is C-R-E, which in English has obvious meanings of uh, creation or increase as well. Um, and then On is the city in Egypt where that was the center of the cult for, of Ra. And so there's a not quite as obvious or, uh, connection, but it's definitely a strong one. Um, so even though we have some, some, some basic uh, correspondences, and actually there are many more, uh, but because of time, I'll just limit it to a few. Uh, the scholar or this, this you know, genuine seeker who would look at Oedipus, the Oedipus plays, would immediately recognize that the central theme is this incest between the son and the mother, and that Oedipus had married his mother and had, and had produced sons or children by her. And so anyone who knows anything about the Bible or you know, um, spiritual things, I think, would immediately have a bad vibe about that, you know, that that's probably not genuine history there. Um, and so what we need to do if we're going to go forward in this is, you know, we've got to deal with that issue. You know, we can make some abstract, you know, uh, correspondences between Oedipus and Moses and Akhenaten, but until we deal with that central theme in Oedipus, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Uh, so what I uh, decided to do was to try to find independent evidence that Moses was married to his mother. And uh, you know, as crazy as that sounds, uh, um, that's what I decided to do. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you um, three textual type of proofs very briefly, and then also br briefly mention Velikovsky again that uh, William brought up. Um, because m many of Velikovsky's ideas have been um, discredited. Uh, he had a, a very unique chronology that uh, has been dismissed uh, uh, entirely, but uh, many people don't realize that he also studied Moses and Oedipus and uh, Akhenaten. He, he dismissed Mo that, that Moses could have been Akhenaten and, and Oedipus because of his chronology. And his chronology it couldn't have lined up. So even though Freud had identified <laughs> Moses and Akhenaten, his, uh, his follower, I guess, uh, Velikovsky rejected the Moses but made the connection to Oedipus. So once, you know, two steps forward, one step back. <laughs> uh, so he, uh, in his book that's nearly 40 years old, which I read recently and is still a, an extremely fresh read, you know, after all this time, uh, you know, makes some, some very unique uh, uh, analysis of Akhenaten and brings out some, some archaeological evidence that is not generally discussed. 
um, or interpreted uh, you know, fairly. Uh, although there's no direct archeological evidence that, uh, that uh, Akhenaten became the consort of T, or uh, Ahmed uh, pronounced it uh, Thai. Uh, other people pronounce it T or Tia. Um, there's no direct, but there is circumstantial archeological evidence, you know, based on a couple of murals at the city of Akhetaten, also based on the fact that after, um, after the death of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten's predecessor, um, Akhenaten went to Thebes and uh, uh, was, you know, be was, became the successor and was anointed and became pharaoh. However, the, Tia, instead of becoming just the queen mother figure and pushed aside, um, continued to have a lot of power and prominence. In fact, Nefertiti, who is Akhenaten's wife, was basically uh, pushed aside in favor of Tia. Uh, and so, although that doesn't prove anything, it, it is some evidence that most people don't consider. And uh, so, with that, uh, you know, I wanted to go into the biblical side and examine some textual arguments that might make that connection. Um, in the, uh, we mentioned uh, Jethro as one of the names for the father-in-law of, uh, of Moses. Uh, there's another name given in the Bible for Moses' father-in-law, and that is uh, Ruel. And Ruel literally means friend of God. It's a nice, charming, quaint kind of name. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because of this time period that, that the associations have been made, that if we go and look at the titles of Yuya, uh, which one of them uh, Ahmed mentioned, uh, there are some very, uh, some very striking uh, uh, formal titles that seem to be very intimate. And uh, uh, these, these titles that were found in Yudhya's tomb included great friend, soul friend, first, first of friends, um, confidant of the good God, confidant of the king, first among the king's companions. There was this you know, very unusual emphasis on friend friendship, you know, that uh, was associated with Yuya, not something that you would find, you would expect to find as, you know, titles of a, of a great person uh, at all. Um, so there is, you know, at least a linguistic connection between Yuya and Ruel, uh, based, you know, not only on the name, but the, the relative time period that we're talking about. Um, So what I wanted to do is I to take a few of these name associations and, and combine them together from the Bible and from Oedipus and then superimpose them on the, uh, the kind of the genealogy that uh, has been established by archeology span for the time period. Um, Yudhya was married uh, to a high ranking uh, woman by the name of Tuya who uh, Ahmed brings out in his books is, corresponds uh, to the biblical Asenath. And uh, then Yuya and Tuya's daughter, are, they had three children. This is known from archeological sources uh, that were Tia, I, which we talked about was associated with Creon and uh, um, Jethro. And then there was an end.